and welcome back to another Dark Souls Law discussion. I am Silvermon, aka Alex, and last week we covered Ornstein and Smo. Or was I deciding to call him Smow? Or Smoth? Or something Pikachu? No, Snorlax, that was it. Anyway, last week we covered Ornstein and Smow. The guardians of the, of the cathedral in Anor Londo. But that's not all they are. Ornstein is a dragon slayer and Smo an executioner. But the dragon slayer is also part of another group. Gwyn's Four Knights. The Four Knights of Gwyn, Abysswalker Artorius, Lord's Blade Kieran, Hawkeye Goth, and Dragon Slayer Ornstein, Gwyn's four most trusted knights, furthering his cause, be it silencing his enemies, slaying the dragons, or even halting the spread of the mysterious Abyss. But is Ornstein really their leader? He is certainly the Leo Ring wielder, and Leo is the lion, and the lion is the king of beasts, but we can't be too sure. How did Gwyn choose these particular four anyway? Were they his personal friends? And just what was the relationship between the four like? That's what we're here to discuss. And who are we talking about today? Well, it's mostly content exclusive to the Artorias of the Abyss expansion DLC, so if you haven't played that yet, you might want to skip this video to save yourself some spoilers. That said, it's been out for like, well over a year by now, and uh, let's begin. Today we're talking about Lord's Blade Kieran and Hawkeye Goth, the smallest and largest of the four knights respectively. Let's start with Kieran. First, her name. Kieran pronounces her name as Kiran, in dialogue cut from the game as does Goth, but I'm going to keep saying Kieran for now. Kieran is typically a male name of um, Gaelic origin. I might have pronounced Gaelic wrong, but <clears throat> there's a, there is a female form of the name, Kira, as in Kira Knightley, for example. As to why Kieran has a boy's name, well, it doesn't really have any impact on anything I expect, though it's possible she was a Mulan type, you know, from the Disney movie, and changed her name from Kira to Kieran, and wore her mask to hide her feminine looks and to be treated like a man. It's possible. She's the only female member of the Knights, after all. As for the actual meaning of Kieran, well, it has connotations of darkness, blackness, and a literal meaning of little dark one, which is quite appropriate for her, no? She is small, slender, and almost an archetypal rogue or thief class. Indeed, from the description of her Gold Tracer sword, Kieran brandishes her sword in a mesmerising dance, etching the darkness with dire streaks of gold, and her Silver Tracer dagger. The victim is first distracted by the dazzling streaks of the Gold Tracer, then stung by the vicious poison of the dagger. Her dagger also has high critical modifiers and a toxin effect. Classic rogue or thief stuff right there. But what really clues us in on her nature as an assassin, what gives her name's meaning some credence, is the description of her armour. A robe common to all of the Lord's Blades, these deadly women shift nimbly between layers of darkness, etching streaks of gold into the night air, and planting visions of terror into the minds of their targets. So we know that she was the leader of the Lord's Blades, a group of assassin perhaps. And we know that they are all female, and that is common enough. You cannot find tropes of all female assassins. But I don't think the Lord's Blades use their feminine wiles to seduce their enemies, like, for example, Kunoichi. They might, but there's nothing in evidence of this in-game, really. So we know the meaning of her name, and we know that who the Lord's Blades are. But what is Kieran? She's the only one of the four knights who uses a player model and is human-sized. But I think this was mostly just a time and budget issue. From looking at her, she seems to be a human, but if we look at the description of her mask, we get some interesting info. The Cyclops headpiece is common to all of the Lord's Blades, but Kieran was determined to earn this soft porcelain mask as a unique decoration of honour. The mask is lined with ivory locks of hair. That is quite an interesting description. 
if the headpiece is common to all the Lord's Blades, then why is Kieran's a unique decoration of honour? And does it mean she is a cyclops, that she has only one eye? I don't think this is the case. Also interesting to note, the braid of hair we see coming from her mask doesn't seem to be her hair. It's part of the mask, a decoration. A lot of fan art depicts her as being a pale white girl with ivory pale blonde hair. This is probably just so people can recognise her when she's out of her armour and her mask. It isn't really important either way, but her voice actor is black, interesting to note. As for the nature of her being, more telling than item descriptions is her dialogue. In particular, she has several lines where she refers to humans in such a way that implies she is not one of them. Are you human? And, hmph, you humans, always taking what you please, then I shall do the same. And when you attack her, and finally when slain, but how, you humans, my dear Artorius. It is worth noting that the last part of that dialogue, my dear Artorius, is not actually subtitled in the game. Either way, this dialogue makes it clear that she isn't a human. I'm going to assume she is a demigod-like being, along with Ornstein, Artorius, and so on. Speaking of Artorius, what is Kieran's relationship with him? We know that in-game she requests you give her his soul, so she might pay her respects, and cut content seems to suggest that if you had the wolf ring, she would ask you for it, likewise to pay her respect. She also seems to indicate that Marvelous Chester stole the ring. Indeed, I'm of the impression that Chester might have set this whole thing in motion, or at least had some part in doing so. Maybe he was the one who suggested that the citizens of Ulusil go digging. Or maybe it was Karth. But that's not the subject here. That ring. It was purloined by a man in a long coat. Purloined essentially means it was stolen. She refers to Artorius as a dear companion, and in Sif's area in the base game, like where you fight Sif as a boss, we find the Hornet Ring, Kieran's ring, on what seems to be a female corpse behind Artorius's grave. There are two explanations for this, assuming it is Kieran herself, her body. First, we kill Kieran next to his grave in the DLC. Second, she simply sat at his grave and prayed until death found her. I believe both are possible. It is quite sad, really, isn't it? The four knights seem to have their purposes robbed from them. Goff and Ornstein have no more dragons to hunt and slay. Kieran exclaims she has no more use for her weapons, and as an assassin, it is quite possible that she associates her weapons with herself, because she is a lord's blade for Gwyn. She is Gwyn's blade and now she's saying she has no more use for her blades, which could mean there is no more use for her. And what about Artorius? He at least dies with a purpose. Even though he did die and did fail in his task, I think a knight would be happy in some way to die with sword in hand. Ornstein is left guarding an illusion, Goff lacks purpose and simply makes wood carvings and Kieran wanders like a lost lamb, looking for Artorius. It seems very likely to me that Kieran loved Artorius. She refers to him as dear, and also states that Artorius would not have approved, which indicates that she sought his approval often, most likely. But were the feelings mutual? I do not think so. Since she was robbed of Artorius, and lacks no other drive, it does seem to me that she waited by his grave until her death, perhaps hoping it would let her find him in the afterlife, if there is such a thing. And what of Hawkeye Goff? The title Hawkeye is much like Ornstein's Dragon Slayer title, and Artorius's Abyss Walker title, which is an interesting one. Was he only known as the Abyss Walker after his death, posthumously? And why Hawkeye?
because this giant is one hell of a shot with his montbow, uh, greatbow rather, and the description of the dragon slayer greatbow tells us, Bow of the dragon slayers, led by Hawkeye Goth, one of Gwyn's four knights. That was some of the first solid info we had on Gwyn's knights. We know that Hawkeye Goth was an archer, and most likely a giant, and we also find his ring near the giant blacksmith, one of the special rings granted to the four knights of Gwyn. The hawk ring belongs to Hawkeye Goth, who led the great archers, boosts bow range so that arrows fly like they were shot by Goth's great bow, which took down high-flying dragons. We do have conflicting information here. First, they were called dragon slayers, and then great archers. Were they called both interchangeably, or was that a mistake? Although the hawk ring is found right next to a giant, we know that blacksmith isn't Goth. For starters, they have different voice actors. Second, Goth has a line of dialogue. I would have much to talk about with that blacksmith. In truth, how is the old chap, I wonder? Still hammering away, I should hope. Worth noting, though, before the DLC, there was much speculation that the giant was goth, and back then, it was a much more credible theory, but nowadays, it is more or less confirmed that they, they are not the same person. Also worth noting, as Kieran calls herself Kiran, or Kiran, so too does goth, but again, in unused dialogue. His name is stated in-game by himself to be Goth, and Goth, I believe, is a Welsh surname, but I'm not too sure on that, it might be Irish or Welsh or Gaelic, I'm not, I'm not sure what it means either, however the giant does back up what I mentioned above regarding Kieran. she had strong feelings for Artorias, the poor, poor girl. The wording of this unused dialogue makes it quite evident that Artorias did not returned Kieran's feelings, or was oblivious to them. To be honest, even though Goth gives us a lot of information, there isn't that much to talk about. Sure, I can just repeat all his dialogue, but what's the point of that? He outright tells us a lot of things. He is as close as we get in Dark Souls to a Skyrim character. And what I mean by a Skyrim character is, people in Skyrim typically exist to info dump you. It's like, you can walk up to them, and they will just unnaturally go, Ah oh, yes, that's the cave of the mighty Lord Fralo, who long ago stole the golden gypsies from Timbuktu, and then turned himself into a dragon, and now you need to kill the dragon by going to the greybeards of Mount Skyrim, and learning to scream so hard you bust up dragons. Yeah, I've not got very far in Skyrim, can you tell? Can you tell? I can tell, because uh, I got bored of Skyrim after about like five hours of waddling around, but I'm digressing, so let's move on. Let's look at Goth's dialogue concerning Manus and the Abyss. I suspect thou hast taken a gander at it, but the dark of the Abyss, which swallowed poor Artorius, seems to devour our entire land of Ulysil. Sorry threatens to devour our entire land of Ulysil. It seems that this dire fate is unavoidable, but, seduced by a dark serpent or no, they awoke that thing themselves and drove it mad. One's demise is always one's own making, and, if thine wish is to succeed poor Artorius and challenge the spread of the dark, then thou must face Manus, father of the Abyss. The dark emanates from Manus himself. Even if this land shall expire, thou may be able to prevent further corrosion. But even so, one day the flames will fade, and only dark will remain. And even a legend such as thine self can do nothing to stop that. First off, Interesting to note that he mentions Ulysil as being our land, 
although it seems to be typically inhabited by humans, being far below Anna Londo. Second, we have more evidence that Carth, or Frampt, was behind this when he mentions Dark Serpent. But you know, that's quite self-explanatory. As with Kieran, Goff has a little dialogue concerning humans, which includes humans, humph, <laughs> vile creatures, which makes it clear that humans were basically the bottom of the food chain in the Dark Souls world, no? Demigods and giants seem to get along well enough, but humans, they seem to be treated like shit, apparently. Could this have anything to do with the Four Kings and Manus? Could they have been seeking power to attack the gods, much as Gwyn did the dragons? Maybe. Goth, though, is a great archer, we know that, and he helps us fight Calamite, one of the last dragons, if not the last dragon. Certainly a strong one, Black Dragon Calamite, we know that. As mentioned, Goth is probably one of the most exposition dump characters that exists in Dark Souls. But why was he locked in that tower? Actually, how did he get in that tower to begin with? Was it built around him? Did he jump on a dragon then get dropped in? It doesn't seem as if he deliberately locked himself away or is trapped and seems to care that he's trapped. No, the only thing he laments is that he lost his purpose. What with there being no dragon stuff? Interesting to note, though, is the fact that he refers to himself as blind. If we look at the description of his helmet, we see Helm of Hawkeye Goth, one of Gwyn's four knights, received as a decoration of a knightly honour. A helm crafted especially for the honourable Hawkeye Goth, only the eye holes were packed with tree resin by those who dismissed Goth as a brutish giant. Now, there are two ways you could read that last sentence. First, as I read it, only the eye holes were packed, blah blah, or only the eye holes. Which could mean that only the eye holes were packed, but in the first sense it is used like almost as a replacement for but, such as helm crafted for goth, but the eye holes were packed, da 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 da. But still, Maybe that has something to do with why he's locked away. But we, but he never mentions the fact that he's locked in a tower, as far as I can recall, which is very strange. Back to the subject of his helmet, though. All of the knights have rings from Gwyn as gifts. The Hawk Ring, the Leo Ring, the Hornet Ring, and the Wolf Ring. And I think it is fair to say that their helms, too, were gifts. From Gwyn? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe from Gwyn's first one, maybe from Gwyndolin or Guinevere or humans, who knows? Or maybe from the giants. This is quite a common thing. Crest helms would often be worn as ceremonial items to display just how important you were, even if they weren't that practical. Goth must have been quite taken with this helm, because even when the eye holes were packed with resin, he didn't consider taking it off. For that matter, the resin is probably what blinds him. Does that mean the resin literally blinded him? Or is it just blocking the holes so he can't see out? And is Goth a bit too silly to take his helmet off? I think it is the second. They dismissed Goth as a brutish giant. So maybe there was tension between the demigods and the giants. Or maybe it was the humans who packed his helmet with resin. We don't know. Either way, it seems they blocked up the holes when Goth was sleeping, and then he woke up and thought he must be blind, not even considering to take off his prized helm. Which would make Goth both a wise, thoughtful character, but also a rather foolish one. Either way, Goth is most certainly a bro and not someone to mess with, for he is more than capable, even without his famous bow. Perhaps even a match for Artorius of the Abyss.